Hey, Foothills family. Today we're reading Acts 25. And before we get into it, I just want to start by saying thank you. This is my last video in the series, and it's been such an honor being a part of this and a joy reading this great book with my Foothills family. You know, today we're reading what comes next in the arrest and trial of the Apostle Paul. You know, a few chapters ago, he got arrested by this mob. They weren't really looking to bring him in, but thankfully he made it. And then he has to defend himself over and over again before the council, before the former governor. And at this point, he's been in prison for two years. And there's a new governor in town. And this governor, Festus, is bringing the trial back up. And uh, as we get into it, well, as I get into my devotions, just typically what I ask the Lord is, God, may you reveal yourself and may you show me from this text that I'm reading ways that I can relate it to my life, to what I'm going through, and to what our culture, our society is going through. As I did that, the first thing that stood out was simply this. This is taking forever. This is a long, drawn-out, tedious situation that the Apostle Paul is in. You know, he's been arrested, but they don't have enough evidence to really do anything with him, but he can't be released because... Wherever he goes, he's causing problems in the best ways. And so Paul is stuck in this situation that seems to take forever. And a lot of us, we have situations, we have challenges or struggles that also can seem to be drawn out. They could seem like it's just, I don't know when we're going to finally find freedom or see justice. And we have to choose how we are going to respond. As we get into this text, I want to get personal with it. I want to ask myself, all right, what is Paul going through? How would he respond? And, you know, he has a few options. He could stand down, just deny the faith, but that's not really an option. You know, what God has done for him, the, what God has done through his ministry, he's not fighting for his own fame or fortune or reputation. He's fighting for the cause of Christ. So then what else are his options? Well, he could fall into depression or play the blame game. I know too often that that's the easy, easy thing to do is just say, why me? Or why couldn't someone else have done something so that I could avoid this situation? And to make matters worse, Paul's enemies, we read in verse 3, they're not relying on the judicial system. If they have an opportunity, they're going to ambush and kill the Apostle Paul. And a lot of the things we deal with, it's not like we're dealing with all righteous people either. You know, we deal with people who are doing things they shouldn't do. And yet we have an opportunity to continue working with Christ and fighting for his causes. And that's what Paul does right here. I want to read how he responds in verse eight, and we're going to read through verse 11. Paul says uh, in his own defense, this is verse eight, I've committed no offense either against the law of the Jews or against the temple or Caesar. But Festus, the governor, wishing to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? Now, I don't know if Paul knew about the ambush or not, but he knows going to Jerusalem, nothing good is going to come of that. So we read on verse 10. I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I've done no wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. If then I'm a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But none of those things is true of which these men accuse me. No one can hand me over to them. And Paul ends here by saying, I appeal to Caesar. Because when we take our eyes off our situation, we put them on our Savior, we find new motivation and cause to continue fighting for the things that matter most. And that's what Paul has done here, is he's not getting caught up in the long drawn out process. He's not getting caught up. He's saying, all right, what can I do now to continue fighting for the things that Jesus would have me fight for? So he appeals to Caesar. And by doing that, we understand he knew his rights as a Roman citizen. And us as Americans, we should know our rights so that we can use them for the cause of Christ as best as possible. But then by appealing to Caesar, he has a couple opportunities here. He could actually go to Rome and stand before Caesar and share the gospel with 
the most important or most influential person uh, of the time? Well, I guess you can argue other than himself. But uh, also, Paul has wanted to go to Rome for quite some time. You know, we know from his writings in Romans 1, which he wrote a few years before this, that he had longed to go to the city and share the gospel and meet with believers there. And now he has an opportunity. Under house arrest, he will still be able to write letters and meet with people if they come to his house. So he's using this situation, these circumstances, he is still using them to continue sharing the gospel. We're all going through something different during these times. But if we're willing to look for an opportunity, God will provide uh, ways that we can continue sharing his good news. In the second part of this chapter, we read that the governor and King Agrippa, who was the, the Jewish ruler in that area, they meet and they're discussing the trial. And uh, Festus, his take on it, he, he shares in verse 19, he says simply this, they, that means Paul and his enemies, simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive again. And then in verse 22, the king says that he wants to hear Paul's arguments as well. You know, Paul's situation is ridiculous. He's been in prison for way too long. Uh, there's tons of corruption and wickedness going on. But despite all of that, don't miss this. The most influential people in his region are hearing the gospel. You know, I want to end by just sharing some good news that I read the other day. Uh, over the last few weeks, over half of the churches in America are seeing growth. And this is coming after uh, quite a few years of decline in church attendance in our country. And what we see is that in Acts 25, amidst all the craziness that's happening, and in our current situation, amidst the quarantine and churches not being able to gather physically, there is still life that is, is coming from the situation. People are still hearing the gospel and coming to know their Savior, Jesus. I, I hope you will join me in praying that whatever we're going through, whatever it looks like, even if the situation seems long and drawn out, let our prayer be that life would come through it as we make ourselves available as ambassadors for Christ.